they have the internet on computers now. An anthology about the bad, the short-lived, and the forgotten shows and events in television history. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Before I change my mind! I give you Super Train! Oh, Episode 372. Submission 162. Whiz Kids. Whiz Kids aired on the CBS television network from October 5th, 1983 to June 2nd, 1984 for a total of 18 episodes. Mike, how many more or less episodes is it than the Hudson Brothers Razzle Tassel show and Uncle Clark's block? Exactly two. Two! Hudson Brothers Razzle Dazzle show and Uncle Clark's block ran 16 episodes. 18 minus 16 is two, believe it or not. I would have said seven, but whatever. Of course, it's two. Not an idiot. And it's the sixth episode that we've covered that originates in October of 1983. The other five are Go, the Coneheads 1983 animated pilot, the 1983 High School USA TV movie, Jennifer Slept Here, and last but not least, the match game Hollywood Squares Hour. Sadly, Manimal missed premiering in October of 1983 by one day. Darn it, Manimal, you gotta try harder. All right, here's the theme song. I mean, we're not that far away from Tron. Well, Tron was a year earlier in EV2. We're not that far removed from Tron. <laughs> we're keeping that in. <laughs> Starcade is giving away robots. Robots? Robots. What's a robot? You don't know what a robot is? <laughs> you are so dumb! <laughs> dumb! Oh, go soak your fat head. Mr. Wizard is playing with computers in his lab and also playing with robots. The kids of today have a big advantage going into the future. Oh, yeah. And earlier this year, in 1983, there was a little movie that comes up. That will come up later. Trust us on this one. But back to all of the computers. Philip DeGare, who is the creator of 
Simon and Simon on the CBS television network, he's noticing kids and computers. And he's noticing them together. And the chemistry just defines itself. He was recognizing the importance of computers not only to youth writ large, but in his work as a TV producer. He embraced the new technology, and he thought it could make an interesting premise. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, War Games was a big movie in 1983, so obviously everyone else wanted to capitalize on, oh, well, what's all this hubbub about all these computers going around? And also, 1983, you got the Commodore 64 out, you got the Apple II, we're like a few months away from the Apple Macintosh. IBM's got something too. Yeah, Atari's got their own line of home computers that Alan Alda's pushing. Computers are like all the rage in 83. Oh yeah, this will probably come up during the break, but there's a familiar face hawking a lot of computers. So yeah, uh, computers are everywhere. And so are criminals. And so are child geniuses. So computers, child geniuses, crime drama. And War Games just came out. So we could basically do a weekly version of War Games. Only not with world-ending consequences. And so Philip Daguerre was basically in his chair thinking... How can I do War Games Weekly without world-ending consequences? Especially since CBS reportedly frowns on that. Well, Philip DeGare repeatedly stated in many interviews that his idea for this show was originally conceived in 1981, and it was validated when Time Magazine named The Computer... The 1982 Man of the Year. This was like how, like, in 2006, like, you became the person of the year in time. That's something you could put on a business card. Yeah. Technically, I am a former Time Magazine person of the year. So, in addition to Daguerre's 1981 computer crime meets detective work, Bob Shane, who helped develop the show, thought that he wanted to do the Hardy Boys, but he wanted to do it properly. He wanted to do a Hardy Boys for the age we're living in. So, Hardy Boys, computer age, put it together, everybody's gonna love it. So, Universal Television bought in in 1982. Daguerre adds the computer aspects. Bob Shane adds the detective aspects. And Universal Television was originally going to pitch this, not to CBS, but to ABC and NBC. They wanted to put this show on opposite 60 Minutes. I think Voyagers pretty much proves that if you put a show on opposite 60 Minutes, you're gonna have a bad time. Well, also in 83, wasn't NBC thinking, oh, we want to get that sweet 60 Minutes action? So they had, wasn't Monitor gonna be the competition for 60 Minutes? Monitor was gonna be the competition for 60 Minutes. Yeah, go back to the Voyagers episode where we talked about it. Yeah. And remember when we talked about it, the TV version of Monitor it wasn't even called Monitor. It was something else. It was like first camera. First camera. That's what it was. Remember when we talked about the ratings uh, back in 83, 84? Like every week, not even joking, it was, if not at the bottom of the ratings, like second or third from the bottom of the ratings. It was dead. Yeah. Apparently, the audience that would watch First Camera 
They were watching 60 Minutes. But this was going to be different. This was a youth-centered show with a youth audience in mind. So CBS was like, well, you're going to put it all up in 60 Minutes? Can't have that. Now we're just going to buy the show from you. And we're going to give you $2 million to film a pilot. So that's exactly what Philip DeGare and Bob Shane did. Three months later, CBS watched the pilot and greenlit the series. Philip DeGare went on to say, We specifically cast the high school characters at an age where it would be fun to watch them grow. And if the show clicks, we'll follow them right through college. And at least for a while, that made sense. So, who are the Wiz Kids? We have our main Wiz Kid, Richie Adler, who has a room full of technological and computer wizardry. I want to say it was put together from four or five different systems. And he managed to make a single computer that could talk. So, his companion, a talking computer. Richie Adler, played by Matthew Laberto, who is a known film, television, and voice actor, but also known as Patrick Laberto's younger brother. Patrick Laberto, of course, being from JAG. Didn't we talk about Matthew on Celebrity Hot Potato last year? Yes, we did. Actually, he would have been on Wiz Kids at this moment because Little House, because he was on 89 episodes of Little House, and that would have been canceled by the time Hot Potato came around. Yeah, because it would have been, Little House's last season would have been 82, 83, I believe. But we also talked about him when we were talking about Here's Boomer. Oh, that's right. Here's Boomer. You know, guys, in 2021, you could have picked Here's Boomer, and we could have reviewed it a lot earlier. But no, you wanted us to talk about The Master. You wanted us to talk about Lee Van Cleef and Timothy Van Patten. And Shokasugi, hello? Yeah, that's true. I'm surprised when you mentioned Hot Potato, we didn't get a little Johnny O there. Hot Potato? Hey, it's been a long while. Hey, what are you guys talking about? Oh, Johnny, we're talking about the show WizKids on CBS. Really, you're talking about that show? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, uh, I've been playing uh, some uh, Sierra Online games. Have you ever played the games on Sierra Online? That's some great shit. <laughs> yeah, Johnny. We've been playing a lot of the Sierra online. Yeah, they are indeed some hot... Yeah. yeah. Okay, why did I even mention Hot Potato if we are going to get into that? I'm just surprised that Johnny didn't mention his robot doppelganger. Oh, that's right! Why didn't my robot doppelganger audition for this show? I have no idea. Hey, while we're breaking out the hits, how about we talk about the time that Johnny Olsen won a Boy George Lookalike contest? That's right, I did a great job winning that Boy George Lookalike contest. You want to hear me sing Karma Chameleon Us? No! 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 Anything but that! Anything but that! Johnny, Johnny, it's been fun having you back here. It's been a long time since we've seen you. Just, okay, just, can you please leave that? Okay, guys. I'll see you later. Hey, Hey, Johnny, before you go... After the show, you can sing Karma Chameleon for me. Oh, that's great, guys. Let's do that after the show. Oh, oh boy. Karma, 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 chameleon. It comes and goes. Yeah, it needs to go that way. <laughs> as we were saying. As we were saying, indeed. His best friend, Hamilton Ham Parker, was played by upcoming actor and model Todd Porter. 
not much to his career. I mean, he did voice Pinocchio in a 1980 made for Pinocchio's Christmas. But yeah, his last credit was a 1986 episode of Kate Valley. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm surprised we don't have Jane Curtin saying that. Anyway. Greg with the impeccable timing there. Oh my gosh. Well, hey, I do have a clip of Matthew saying it from an episode of Wiz Kids. Hey, Matthew, do you want to say it? Uh-oh. And I will find the clip of him saying uh-oh, and we'll add it to the pile with Susan and Patty. Patty Duke and that other guy. I Teresa Merritt. Teresa Merritt. Teresa Merritt. And I have Pat McAfee, too, so we can just have, a, like, a uh-oh pile. It's like, one, two, three! The Owls are gonna take game three. That's bullshit. Anyway. What are you doing to my podcast, all these uh-ohs? It's Our fun. podcast, but still, no. we're gonna have... <laughs> We're going to have at least five different versions of Uh-Oh. Oh, my gosh. And then the fun thing, funny thing is going to be, again, you guys will say, oh, hey, Susan, what do you think? Uh-Oh. Uh-Oh. Nope, I put in Patty Duke. Fuck y'all. <laughs> oh, my Okay, God. moving on. Oh, yeah. Their second friend, Jeremy Saldino, is played by Jeffrey Jacquet. And he actually, if you remember Mark and Mindy, he played little Eugene. Oh. He was everybody's favorite little jive cat. And nowadays, he's retired from acting, and he's a lawyer. Oh, that's nice. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, no. Damn it, Mike. I'm sorry, I don't want to show my hand when it comes to lawyers, but th that's how I feel. Okay. <laughs> and the fourth whiz kid, Alice Tyler, is played by Andrea Elson, who you would all remember as Lynn Tanner on Elf. Remember Elf? He's back in pod form. He's back in pod form. Oh, no. Now, Richie did have a little sister, Cheryl, played by Melanie Gaffin, who actually was a that girl from that thing, but she did play in ten episodes of My Little Pony. The original, not the Friendship is Magic one. You know what other show she did voices for? What other show did she do voices for? For three episodes. I just love saying this whenever it comes up. Foofer! <laughs> Wait, what? Foofer! You, we've done this in the past where some people, if they do voices on Foofer and Chico reminisces about uh, the, the 26 episodes of Foofer. I remember the 26 episodes of Foofer. Like I just said, he reminisces about the 26 episodes they of Foofer. They put a smile on my face. <laughs> and playing the adults in the room, I guess you could say. First of all, we have the one who was actually billed first in the credits, which I don't get, but whatever. An investigative writer named Llewellyn Farley Jr., played by Max Gale. And I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong here, this is his first role after Barney Miller got canceled. It would make sense. Barney Miller ended in 1982. And he wears a fedora and a happening mustache for this. Uh, actually, it's the first TV show after Barney Miller for Max uh, Gale. He did, however, earlier in 1983, he was in the movie DC Cab. Oh, with Mr. T. With, with Mr. T. T. There you go. Nice. And Bill Moore. Did we not forget Bill Moore was also in DC Cab? Mr. T, nice. And Mr. T, thank you. All right, playing their liaison in 17 of the 18 episodes, Lieutenant Neil Quinn, A. Martinez, Cruz Castillo on Santa Barbara, 
My sister thought he was dreamy. He was also in L.A. Law for like four or five seasons. And hey, wait, hold on, hold on. Oh God, I can't believe I'm saying this. Oh I wasn't going to say it. I was like, waiting for someone to break the ice. <laughs> wait, Greg, are you and me going to make the same joke? Not a Pulaski episode. No, 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 not that. I was going to say what happened if Eddie Mecca just ran into him in the hall. Hey, Martinez! Hey! hey. Hey, Martinez, can you believe this guy in a Baltimore went down the elevator shed? Hey! I really don't want to talk about it. Ah! Oh. Oh. oh my god! Hey, if she was gonna go down to a pizza, she could have taken the stairs instead of taking <laughs> the elevator. Hey! But everyone knows there's no good pizza in LA. It's all crap. Hey! Hey, what do you mean it's a Pulaski episode? Nowadays, you can see him play Nardo Ramos on The Bay. So, yeah, he's still in your mama's stories. If your mama is online, that is. Where is it streaming? The Bay? It's on Peacock. Oh, that's even better. It's on the cock. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, what the heck is going on here? We're doing Pulaski jokes, we're doing Eddie Mecca jokes about A. Martinez, and now we're doing jokes about Peacock. <laughs> Rounding out the adults is Irene Adler, who is Richie and Cheryl's mom, played by Madeline Kane, who, like most of the adults on this show, totally doesn't get what Richie's doing right now. Because she's a dumb adult. Because she is a dumb adult. But this would not be her first brush with televised technology because she plays Miss Sheets on an episode of Small Wonder. The robot's a little less cuboid. Anyway, let's talk about all of these crazy adventures that all of these kids get into. And the adults who put up with them. Episode 1. Programmed for murder. This was the pilot. Murder. Murder. Murder? It was murder. Thank you, Lionel Stander. The Wiz kids discover a skeleton on property coveted by a development corporation and join forces with a reporter, Lou Farley. So basically, the first case. Obviously, they're going to be a little bit more sinister with their computer play. Now, wait a second. They shortened Llewellyn Farley to Lou Farley? Yeah. Okay, that's an interesting call. I like Llewellyn as a first name. I like that. And it works as a good last name, too. Doug. Doug Llewellyn. Say the line, Greg. What'd you think of the judge's decision? <laughs> I think it was bullshit. <laughs> so yeah, as the pilot, you get some of the meat in the sandwich there. And you also get some of the uh, obvious allusions to war games in 1983. But a little tones down. Nobody's gonna die, we hope. And in this episode, we have... Oh! We have a name, but we don't necessarily have a character. Jonathan Banks is in this episode. Deputy Brent from Gremlins. Mike Ermentrout Ar from Breaking Bad. And Better Call Saul. And Frank McPike on Wise Guy. And Frank McPike on Wise Guy. So yeah, known entity on this pilot. Or if he wasn't a known entity, then he would be. And I think we talked about him in Stanford, in Stanford verse. And we have an actor, producer, director who is acting on this episode. 
James Whitmore Jr. Again, no character name given on IMDb, but he is known for directing The Good Wife, Hunter, and something we're going to cover later this summer that I'm not going to say. Good. But mostly he's done 48 episodes of NCIS. So, yes, he is a known entity. Oh, also on this episode, playing Gallagher, hey, we got a character name. Michael Horton. If I'm not mistaken, from 30-something. Oh, darn, when he said Gallagher, I hope he said he was being played by Gallagher. I was hoping he'd smash either a watermelon or a computer at the end of the episode. That would have been awesome if Gallagher showed up and he said to the kids, Hey, it's me, Gallagher, I'm going to smash the computer. Oh, God, no. All right. Uh, hey, just was... again, remember, if Gallagher smashed the watermelon at the end of Leave it to Beaver Week and got watermelon all over Richard Deacon, that show lasts six years and somehow a game show gets a movie. Hey, it worked for the Gog Show. Just saying. Hold on. You know what Gene's reaction would be if Calgary had swatched the watermelon? You know what his reaction would have been? Right. I would pay a ticket to see the Match Game in Hollywood Squares movie. We could have reenactments of Magnificent Beard Guy winning the $30,000 twice. Oh, gosh, really? We could have Tom Poston playing Tom Poston to have a coma. It would be like sex set in the Eora style reenactment and everything. Okay. So Michael Horton was not on 30 something. No, don't bury the lead. I love this. We, we could do reenactments of Magic and Hollywood Spurs Hour. <laughs> oh, jeez. Greg's onto something. We just need we, like a, a financial backer. We could get somebody to play Katie to the Meta. Am I going to have to put up the gold fund me after this recording? And somebody could play Morgan Fairchild so Jean could tell her she's gorgeous. You're gorgeous. Exactly. Going directly to the Roku channel sometime in 2027. <laughs> Don't hold your breath, folks. <laughs> Okay, so like you're saying... Okay, so Michael Horton was not in 30-something, but he was a that voice from that thing. He was in The Incredible Hulk, The Transformers, G.I. Joe, multiple episodes of Gem, and he played no less than three characters in the Star Trek universe. In... First Contact, Insurrection, and Voyager. Chico, did you say Jim? I said Jim. That's outrageous. Truly, truly, truly outrageous. Where the heck did we lose control? I'm sorry. Never gets old. Never gets old. <laughs> Episode 2, Fatal Error. If this was done in 2023, it would be Red Ring or Blue Screen of Death. But the episode is called Fatal Error. In 2023, it would be episode 404. <laughs> I think Mr. Robot beat you to it there, Mike, but I admire your gumption. Anyway... <laughs> While engaged in online gaming, the Wiz Kids inadvertently get involved with a prison inmate with bad programming skills and try to help him do the right thing after he escapes. Meanwhile, Lou works to get to the bottom of a story behind the incarceration and keep the Wiz Kids out of harm's way. Ooh, a whole lot of names on this episode. So, playing Dave Kearns, who is, I'm guessing, the prisoner in the episode, David Aykroyd. No relation to Dan or Peter, but we have talked about him before, I think. Yeah, I think we talked about him after Mitch. And uh, a couple more names here. Again, no character names, but their names. Wait, Bill no, hold on. Before we go on, talking about David Aykroyd. 
Oh no. Mike's about to lose it again. No, you're about to lose it. You know why? Why? He did 13 episodes of Fur <laughs> <laughs> How many Fooper references can we get in this episode? All the Fooper references! Yeah! Yeah! Is this the first time we've ever referenced Fooper on this podcast? No! no! Absolutely not! Okay. Oh, also, we talked about uh, David Aykroyd in Teachers Only. Oh, so this is three, so he punches Hall of Fame card, Candace, right now. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and with Fooper, he's probably definitely going in. Hey. I'm not going to say a thing. Anyway, uh, we have two big names in this episode. No idea what characters they play, but we have Mabel King, who is on What's Happening, and Joanna Kearns, who will be on Growing Pains. Oh, don't drop the lead regarding Mabel King. She was the mother on the jerk. (laughs) Oh, the jerk is one of the Funniest movies ever. I love it. He hates these cans. Stay away from the cans. So, uh, the game that they're actually playing that is simulating this guy's prison break, it's similar to, but legally distinct from, the Atari classic game, Adventure. Oh, darn, with somebody in prison, I was hoping you'd say kaboom. (laughs) (laughs) Go back to the Atari commercials, guys. Just go back to it. (laughs) Okay, as an aside, this may be a top ten episode right now, and we're only two episodes in. Oh, Oh, my gosh. Episode three. Deadly Access. Richie discovers a secret water project while he tests the security of a chemical company for a security chief who vanishes after receiving Richie's report. Nobody's gonna say it? Uh Uh-oh. 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 Richard Anderson from The Bionic Woman and The Six Million Dollar Man, obviously, is in this episode as Ted Riker, who I believe is the uh, chief in question who disappears. And hey, speaking of Richard Anderson, Greg, he had a card in Americana. Oh, that's nice. I actually pulled an autograph card of his in my collection. He's not with us anymore, so yeah, he's not signing anything else. But yeah, I have a Richard Anderson card from uh, Americana. I think it was Series 2, so that would have been, I believe, 2008-ish. Yes, oh wait. Also in this episode, no character name, but Greg Malavy is in this episode. You kids would know him best as Grandpa Shay on iCarly. The old iCarly and the new iCarly. Yes. And for those of you who aren't kids, where you would know Greg Malavy from is, he was Mary Hartman's husband, Tom, on Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, And also, he was on Forever Fernwood. There's one more name I have to mention before I get to the big one. Gary Frank, who played Willie Lawrence on Family. He played Carl Fletcher in this episode. So obviously, somebody with something to hide. (laughs) But the big name, the big one, on this episode, which aired October 26th, 1983, we have an appearance by A.J. Simon. What? James and Parker is A.J. Simon. Wow. So they got James and Parker as A.J. Simon to appear in this episode. Yes, and that is important because the next night, the Whiz Kids drop by Simon and Simon. What? Right? Oh my god, this is mind-blowing! So they're officially a part of the Simon and Simon television universe! They are officially part of the Simon and Simon television universe! Now you see, I didn't even think that was going to be your big name. Because I found another name, not maybe as big, but I know Greg's going to appreciate this. 
playing, and I, I apologize, this is what IMDB says, so don't hang it over our heads. Playing an Arab in this episode is Len Lesser. Greg? He was Uncle Leo on Seinfeld. Oh, yes! Uncle Leo! So not only do you get James and Parker in this episode, you get Uncle Leo. So this episode is a season three Simon and Simon episode. It aired the night after episode three aired on WizKids. It's called Flying the Alibi Skies. The Simons attempt to find their client's missing brother, lead them to the murder investigation of their nemesis, Lieutenant Bogardus, which was played by Jonathan Banks, which we talked about earlier. And all four of the WizKids and Mama Irene reprise their roles on this episode. Plus, we have Daphne Maxwell-Reed as Temple Hill, a.k.a. Aunt Viv number two. And Tim Reed's wife. Yes. Which, was Tim Reed on Simon and Simon at this point? Not oh, yet. that's right, because he would be on Teachers Only at this time. No, I think he would be on WKRP at this time. No, no w- WKRP was done uh, at, in 82. Okay. And also, remember when Tim Reed was on... Hey, another reference to Match Game Hollywood Scores Hour. What do you know? Tim Reed was being promoted as being on Simon and Simon. Okay, okay so it, it would be this season. Yeah, 83, 84, yeah. Epi- but he's not in this episode, though, is he? No. Okay. Maybe he came later than the season. I don't know. Arlene Galanka who played Joyce Allred in this episode. She's in this episode. Arlene Galaga, she's been in damn near everything. She played Mrs. Jane Stern in Airport 77, one of the bad ones, unfortunately. Let's be honest. If you've seen Airplane, you've seen all the airport movies. But yeah, she was just in a whole lot of movies and a whole lot of television. I'm not even going to go into it because we'd be here all day. Let's go into the next episode, shall we? Episode 4, Candidate for Murder? When Lou's newspaper photographer inadvertently photographs a wanted man, the resulting murder and growing political cover-up intersect with Jeremy's need to interview a senator for a school-assigned report, requiring Lou and the WizKids to come up with a creative way to save Jeremy before it's too late. Hey, the senator in this episode's a name... And I think it's a name we've talked about, uh, at least in passing. I think we talked about him uh, in episode 310, Few Revisited, Michael Young. This would have been a little bit after he hosted Kids Are People 2. Got another name in this episode, playing a character named Caroline Vanetta McGee. She was in... Busted Loose, all 26 episodes. Yes, they made a TV show out of Busted Loose. Can you believe it? I remember it and Jimmy Walker. Yes, it did. As Richard Pryor. Because Jimmy Walker needed the money. Oh, she also played Sister Indigo on all 10 episodes of Helltown, which was supposed to be... <laughs> which was supposed to be Robert Blake's comeback vehicle. And also Whitman Mayo's for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> Hold on. What happened in Florida, Whitman Mayo? What happened in Florida? My name is Florida. Florida. That's the name of a state. Episode 5. A chip off the old block. The Wiz Kids and Lou help the police when a student's hacking of a local bank intersects with a million dollar heist by a pair of bank insiders. Y'all are not going to believe who plays the student. The student, his name is Chip. He is played by Cousin Oliver himself, Robbie Wrist. So there's life after Cousin Oliver. Okay. Well, he also played Donatello on uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, yeah. All right. Well, we could do a second name. All right. Yeah, this one's maybe on par with uh, Cousin Oliver. Maybe not for the notoriety, but still somebody from the 70s and early 80s. Playing Harvey in this episode is Daryl Anderson. 
He played Animal on Lou Grant. Quick correction. Robbie Rist played Michelangelo on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, well. The movies. But hold on. We do have another big name in this episode. Playing Harlan. Jackie Earl Haley. Yep. Kelly Leak from the Bad News Bears. The original Bad News Bears movies in the 70s. But also, let's not forget, he was the second Freddy Krueger in that forgettable remake from what was it? The late 20, 2000s? It was 2010. 2010. 2010? My it was 2010, God. yeah. I can't believe that's 13 years ago now. Episode 6. Airwave Anarchy. Lou and the Whiz Kids helped the Los Angeles Police Department when the LAPD's first computer-based dispatch system, the mobile data terminal system, is hacked by a team of thieves. No bueno. Playing the lead thief on this episode, Digby, Guy Stockwell, or as I called him while I was watching this episode, that Orson Welles looking mother father. He did look like Orson Welles on this episode. Uh, you know what I call him? What's that? Dean Stockwell's brother. Yeah! We've talked about him in the past. He was on an episode of Voyagers. And playing the captain of police, Captain Huntley, who really wants these computers out of his life and also these criminals out of his life, Alan Miller who played an alien Greg in Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Oh, so it must have been like one of the aliens when McCoy goes to that bar. Yeah. Sir, I'm sorry but your voice is carrying. I don't think you want to be discussing this subject in public. I'll discuss what I like. And who in the hell are you? Could I offer you a ride home, Dr. McCoy? Where's the logic in offering me a ride home, you idiot? If I wanted a ride home, would I be trying to charter a space flight? But he played Inspector Kramer on 14 episodes of Nero Wolf in 1981. He'd been busy. And one more name I'm going to add, and we've talked about this person in the past. This person doesn't have a character name, unfortunately, but we have definitely talked about her in the past. Barbara Kason. She was Gary Shandling's mother on It's Gary Shandling's Show. Oh, you know who she was? I believe she was the customer in the bank with the pearls. Because there was a customer in the bank while all the robbers are doing their nefarious deeds. One of the robbers grabs her pearls. Like, give me those pearls, you innocent bystander, you. And Barbara Kason, we've talked about her looks like at least four different times in the past. She was on Madam's Place. Lynn Levesque in an episode. She was on an episode of Half Nelson, which we've talked about. She was also on an episode of Hello, Larry. But here's why I remember her name, because she wasn't on one episode of this. She was on 44 episodes, I hate saying it, of Carter Country. Moving on. As I say, no reaction needed. Very well played. Episode 7, Return of the Big Rocker. The Wiz Kids start a techno pop band, and Lou gets him involved in the case of a long dead rocker who has a doppelganger performing in Los Angeles. Playing the rocker, Bobby Lee Jans, Marjo Gortner from Earthquake. He was basically the uh, person who kidnapped Victoria Principal and held everybody, including his uh, roommates, hostage. If you really want me to go off the beaten path, he was a celebrity on the first week of Break the Bank in 1976. I wonder what? if he was credited as the world's youngest ordained minister. I had heard that at some point, but he's not the only name in this episode. Oh, by close. no means. Because playing Julius in this episode, somebody we've talked about plenty. Sal Viscuso. Yeah, we did talk about Sal Viscuso. He was in, let's see, 
Well, he was on the $50,000 pyramid. I know we talked about him there. And also, he was on Celebrity Few for a couple of weeks. But where people would know Sal Viscuso from, he was Tim Flotsky on Soap. He was the father, the the, the uh, religious uh, person who fell in love with, um, I think, Diana Canova's character. Yeah, he fell in love with Corinne. Yeah, and yeah, let's and... be honest, if you saw Diana Canova, you'd be like, yeah, I'm going to give up the church for this. Hey, she's a big girl now. Well, she was. Playing a receptionist! Making a case for the Hall of Fame right now! Sally Julian! I don't want to spoil anything, but I think she's going to be in the Hall of Fame because we're definitely going to talk about her, not this pilot month, but in pilot month of 2024. Stay tuned. But hold on a second. This is not going to be the last time this year we're going to be talking about Sally Julian. What? Just wait another month, guys. And it wouldn't be an episode of It Was a Thing on TV without mentioning that Sally Julian, yeah, she did a week of Match Game Hollywood Squares Hour. Going on next episode. Next episode, episode eight. The Wrong Mr. Right. Lou and the Wiz Kids get involved with the shady computer dating service. <laughs> okay, so playing a landlord in this episode is Stanley Brock. We talked about him as Uncle Harvey on UHF. That's right. And also we talked about him in What's Alan Watching last year in Pilot Month. Episode 9, Red Star Rising. Lou, Quinn, and the Wiz Kids get involved in a case involving the Russians industrial espionage, and murder, all while a book report on classic romances due at school. Does this kind of sort of look like anything? Kind of sort of, yeah. The first half, not the second half. Playing Richard Chapman, John Plachette, who was on the first two seasons of Knott's Landing as Richard Avery, and he was a network exec on The Truman Show. He was also on Previous Entry, Magruder and Loud. And then we have, as one of the Russians, Gregor, William Hutkins, who is a Texas actor based in London and was actually on a Tomorrow People serial in the early 1990s. But we would know him best, Greg, you and I, would know him best as Red Six, a.k.a. Porkins, in Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Yes, but also, he's in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where he delivers the immortal line, we have top men working on it. Who? Top men. Never thought we'd mention William Hootkins on this podcast, but there you go. And playing Mark Travers on this episode, Christopher Stone, who charted in The Interns and several guest appearances on Mission Impossible and Wonder Woman, but mostly known for marrying an actress named Dee Wallace, who we will talk about eventually. Oh man, when that happens, I'm going to phone home. Yeah, let's just say the show that she was on, it was everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> I get it. Oh, by the way, no time for love, Mr. Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 10, halfway through the show, guys, The Network. The Wiz kids pick up a message on their school's computer bulletin board from the notorious hacker, The Wretch, which leads them to inadvertently go afoul of the National Security Agency, who they have never heard of. Will Lou, Richie's dad, and local law enforcement be able to protect them from the consequences of their own computer genius? Playing Don Adler, the father, Jim McMullen, who we actually talked about on previous entry, Beyond Westworld. 
he was one of the Delos security chiefs who dispatched uh, Cadi Selica to try and stop all these killer robots from, well, killing robots. Spoiler, it didn't end well. Well, we're over halfway through the show, and disaster has yet to befall the network, so why not take a break right here? Hey, guys, you want to hear a computer voice throw it to break? Sure! Please, kids, we'll continue. Here's something that's going to make a lot of changes. A program called Atari Writer. It turns any Atari computer system into a word processor. All men are created equal. Don't you think there's something a little out of date about that? Just a little, yeah. Why don't you fix that? See, you can make corrections, move whole groups of words around, and print it out on your own stationery. Atari may make the typewriter obsolete. What's the typewriter? See? I see by your job application. You've scored six million on the video game Munchman. Yeah. And I see you shot down two billion aliens from the planet Mongo. Yeah. You are good at computer games. So what do you know about computers? If you're going to spend your time playing video games, why not play them on something that can also teach you about computing? Get a Commodore 64 or VIC-20. It's tough to grow up in a computer age without learning about computers. Sunday, right after the award-winning 60 Minutes, it's Alice. We're going to the circus. And Vera rescues a four-legged friend. He ran away from the circus to join a diner. Then on one day at a time, Black Tuesday. Max receives bad news from Julie, but everyone rallies to cheer him up. Sunday at 60 Minutes, Alice followed by one day at a time. A Super Bowl berth will be at stake tomorrow when the San Francisco 49ers meet the Washington Redskins in the NFC Championship game, starting with the NFL Today on CBS Sports. This is CBS. Meet the Convincer, the new Atari 1200XL. It has a 64K memory, like the Apple IIe, but for about $400 less. Sorry, Apple. Over five times more software than the Commodore 64. Your outrank this time, Commodore. The Atari 1200XL offers three more sound channels and 240 more colors than IBM's personal computer. Guess home computers just aren't your business, IBM. Texas Instruments. Like them, you don't have on-screen self-testing or a help key. Take your hat off, Texas Instruments. The powerful new Atari 1200XL home computer. The Convincer. Atari, the official computer of the Association of Tennis Professionals. We have returned from the break. Here's more WizKids. Boop, beep, boop, boop, boop. Wow. You didn't think our computer could do that, did you? Episode 11. Watch out! An old friend of Luz comes to him to help to find out who is making attempts on his life and trying to destroy the ratings on his TV show. Playing said old friend, Jerry Biggers, Garrett Graham, from The Critic, and Parker Lewis. He was Franklin Sherman. He was also Dr. Pankow, Miss Musso, and Parker Lewis's shared nemesis. But he was also Franklin Sherman. Maybe the best, like, lunatic character of all time. I hear you can say your name backwards. Is that true? Nilknov! What's your favorite food in the whole wide world? Nilknov! But just remember, every new year, we have to boogie with Baby 37. Who's ready to boogie with Baby 37? do 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 do, do, do. Okay. Another name of this episode playing Judy Hubbard, Belinda Montgomery, a.k.a. Doogie Hauser's mama, and also Grandma Flynn in Tron Legacy. And one more name. I really think this guy's making a case for the Hall of Fame because we did not talk about him that long ago. Last week, actually. I thought it was last week. I didn't want to say that, though. I didn't want to commit to that date. Playing Devin Sinclair in this episode is David Groh, and where we know him from, he was Rhoda's husband 
on Rhoda. One more name playing a character named Greg Eddie Barth. He was Angelo in the original Fame movie. And he played Frank the Pug on Men in Black the series. Episode 12. Amen to Amen Ray. The Wiz Kids visit a hands-on museum and help release an Egyptian curse, which affects not only family and friends, but a case of police corruption that Lou is working on. Random uh-oh here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So a lot of names on this one. We gotta start with Madame Zerlina. I swear that is the person's name. Played by Zelda Rubenstein. Legendary. This house is clear. And somebody we talked about earlier, I think, playing D.A. Meeks, Joe Estevez. Oh yes, Morton's brother. But also, let's not forget, he was in the season 10 Mystery Science Theater 3000 classic, Soul Taker. We have another name. Francis X. McCarthy, no character name, but he was in The Man with Two Brains, Basketball, and Interstellar. What the hell is he doing in Interstellar? What is he doing in this Matthew McConaughey movie? By the way, the Curse of the Pharaohs refers to a legendary and alleged curse believed to be cast upon anyone who disturbs the mummy of an ancient Egyptian person, especially a pharaoh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Episode 13. Made in the USA. Made in the USA? Made in the USA. As well, in. This is 30 years before freaking Miley sings it, so what do we have this title for? Well, apparently there's a maid involved, but the Quiz Kids and Lou uncover an international plot. Wait, this we didn't is... hear the rest of the plot. That is the plot. Oh, okay. It's uh, basically a bottle up. So Richie spits out a bunch of technical terms that make no sense in context. That is, hacking is basically magic. But playing the villain in this episode, Mrs. Butterfield, June Lockhart. Oh. And playing a guy by the name of Carson Marsh, Dan O'Hurley, a.k.a. The Old Man. From Robocop. But let's not forget, he was the heel in Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. My buddy, the best of the Halloween movies. Yes, I don't care what Joe Popperick says. Halloween 3 is a classic. I'm surprised they didn't reference that in Halloween Ends. Oh, the fact that there's a big giveaway at 9 o'clock? Why is it specifically 9 o'clock? Consider, is it like 9 o'clock everywhere? Because with time zones and everything, it's just 9 o'clock everywhere? I don't know. No, it's always 5 o'clock somewhere. I guess it works. Uh, 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 I'm just throwing that out there. Hey, but we do have one more name. We do have one more name. Not a big name, but I'm going to say a name. Playing Miguel in this episode is Ira Angustain, he played Ricky Gomez on The White Shadow for three seasons, 40 episodes. But the first time we talked about him, so I get to throw this out, he was on a week of Beat the Clock in 1980 on Celebrity Episodes. Episode 14, The Lollipop Gang Strikes Back. We have a return with uh, Carson Marsh and Dan O'Hurley, but... Cases converge as the Wiz Kids investigate a problem at the Social Security Administration, and Lou works to solve and report on a string of convenience store robberies by a group known as the Lollipop Gang. I'm guessing it's different than the Lollipop Guild. I should hope so. A lot of uh, legendary names on this. Uh, Sylvia Sidney plays Dolly. Whitman Mayo plays Teddy. And play... Hold on. Hold on. Time out. Oh, no. He's going to ask the question again. What happened in Florida, Whitman? <laughs> what happened in Florida? 
I have no idea what the hell happens in Florida. Play Elwood Sellers, Kenneth Mars, King Triton himself. Woo! And playing Doris in this episode, Helen Martin. She was Pearl on 227, the old lady. Yeah, the old lady. The old lady at the window. Yeah, that was the old lady. That's the best way of describing her. She's the old lady in the window. And another name playing Miss Wilson, Susan Blue. Lady of a thousand voices, all of them in the 80s. Please say she was on Foofer. Please say she was on a Foofer. I'm I'm looking for it. I'll tell you right now, she has a career defining role as RC in Transformers the movie. Okay, no, that's not the answer I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear she had a transformational role in Foofer. Even if she did have a role in Foofer, it was not a transformational one. So you're saying she wasn't in Foofer? Oh, she was in Foofer. It just oh, wasn't she was in Foofer, third reference, yeah! But, yo, RC and Transformers the movie. She was there when Optimus bit it. Where do you see she was in Foofer? I don't see her in Foofer. I see her in Foofer. She played Dolly in 16 episodes of Foofer. I'm not fighting it. I, I heard the anger in your voice. If you say she was in 16 episodes of Foofer, she was in 16 episodes of Foofer. Who am I to challenge you? Episode 15, The Soupy Project. Lou's investigation of a missing persons case leads him and the Whiz Kids to uncover a plot involving computerized communication... With dolphins! What's that, Flipper? Uh Uh-oh! Uh-oh. I didn't know Flipper could speak Susan. No character name is given, but Keen Curtis. I believe we talked about him in One in a Million. He's in this episode. Yeah, we definitely talked about him in One in a Million. And then we have, as Branch... Mitchell Lawrence from Not Necessarily the News. Also Matthew's brother. You know, Matthew from uh, Duet. Matthew, thank you. Thank that you. Matthew Lawrence from Duet, not the other Matthew Lawrence. Right. By the way, fun fact, married to the striking Viking, Ava Mattia Lawrence. Really? Yeah, really. That's great. Uh, by the way, Ball Breakers is a future entry. Just saying. Ball Breakers? Ball Breakers. What the hell is Ball Breakers? It's televised pool, Greg. Oh, I thought you meant something else with balls. <laughs> I'm going to go spend some time with my sister. I'll be right. You gotta see. You gotta see. We're fine. <laughs> Just sit down right there. We're fine. Greg was making me think in pure thoughts. Anyway. Hold on. Jeez, like, can you believe that shit ball breaker? <laughs> episode 16. Oh, that's all staying in the episode, by the oh, way. <laughs> episode 16. Father's Day. When the background on Alice's new boyfriend doesn't add up, Lou and the Wiz kids come to the rescue in a case of hidden identities and international spies. Oh, boy. We got a name in this one. Playing Ben Jim McCrell. Y'all know who Jim McCrell is. Don't even tell me you don't know who Jim McCrell is. Well, we talked about him in this podcast before. He was Guy Corbin on the Grab That Dough episode of Golden Girls. Grab that dough. Oh boy. But he was Betty's dad in the return of the Shaggy Dog. That's where Greg knows him best from. I love the return of the Shaggy Dog. That was an underrated episode. Go back in the archives and listen to it. That does not get enough love. That was so great. Especially when he was playing, the dog was playing three-card Monty. We lost our s*** when we saw that. Oh, boy. Oh, mercy, mercy. Okay, and playing Miriam... Sharon Acker played Della in 15 episodes of the new Perry Mason. Not the new Perry Mason that airs on HBO right now. It was actually called the new Perry Mason. Did they get Raymond Burr for that? 
No, he was doing Ironside at that point. Monty Markham was Perry Mason. Who the hell is Monty Markham? Who the hell is Monty Markham? No, no, who, no, seriously, who the hell is Monty? Oh, he was in Airport 77 as a banker. So they got the banker from Airport 77 to play Perry Mason. Ah, oh, great choice. Okay, a little more recent. He was Captain Don Thorpe on Baywatch. Okay, Baywatch. That's, that's all you had to say. A, a little yeah. more contemporary. A little more contemporary. Yeah. But also on the new Perry Mason, you know who was on a number of episodes? Brett Summers. What? Brett, Brett Summers. Oh. Oh. You didn't know this? No, I didn't know this. Hey, yeah. for, hey, up until five minutes ago, I didn't even know there was a new Perry Mason. I knew there was a new Perry Mason. I just didn't know that Raymond Burr wasn't in it. I, I figured he wasn't because, again, Ironside would have been on at this point. Episode 17. Two more to go, folks. Altera. Richie falls in love with the senator's daughter, which puts Farley into a case of political corruption and arms manufacturing, and the Wiz Kids' efforts to save a local park. Playing Laura Calhane, Tammy Taylor, who was in 46 episodes of Days of Our Lives, one episode of Happy Days and Meatballs Part Two. Meatballs Part Two. Greg, she was in an episode of the new Love American Style. Oh, that's fantastic! The new Love American Style, which me and the G Man both agreed was just okay. It was okay. Last episode. May I take your order, please? While working at the drive-thru, Alice puts herself in danger after she overhears the plans for an upcoming crime and needs Lou and the Wiz Kids to save her and foil the crime. Playing, I can't believe I'm going to say this, playing Ahmed, that's his name, Bart Braverman from Vegas. Oh, TV's Bart Braverman. TV's Bart Braverman, yes. And playing Douglas Blackthorn, Charles Napier. Vote for Duke. Vote for Duke. Second critic reference. Well, that's the show. But, and we like to ask, what happened? I got the answer to that, and it lies in the schedule. When it started uh, on television, WizKids aired at 8 p.m. for the full hour on uh, Wednesday nights. That first week, this is not good competition to start. I'll give you the lesser of the two things it went up against, and even the lesser of the two things it went up against was a pretty darn big thing. On ABC was the fall guy. Oh. Oh, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, because on NBC, on the premiere episode... National League Baseball, the Phillies versus the Dodgers. Oh. This is what uh, Philip DeGuerre was warning us about. And this isn't regular season baseball in October 5th of 1983. This would be the playoffs at this point. This was for the National League Championship Series, Phillies versus Dodgers. So it's not like just an average run-of-the-mill weeknight game. Oh, no, it's playoffs. So, yeah, you've got... Tough competition against the fall guy and really tough competition against baseball. Now, to its benefit, it did run in a dead heat the next week against real people. Well, this would have been real people's last season. With Peter Billingsley. And David Ruprecht. And probably and Byron Ruprecht. Allen. Byron Allen and Mark Russell, R.I.P. And Skip Stevenson. And how can we forget Sarah Purcell? Oh, yeah. And Bill Rafferty was there during this time. John Barber! There! We named all of the real people people. Just about, I think. We didn't mention Fred Willard. We didn't mention all the real people people. We didn't mention Fred. Now we did. <laughs> now we did. 
But yeah, even going up against real people in his final season and the fall guy, mm -mm, not happening, sorry. So you know what happened? In 1984, it moved to Saturday nights. Oh. Well, you can judge for yourself because I've got the schedule here starting in 1984. So do you want bad or do you want the worse? Bad, bad, worse. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, okay, we'll start with the bad. We'll make NBC the bad this time. The first half hour, the 8 to 8.30 half hour, was different strokes. This would have been the third to last season, or fourth to the last season, so it still had legs. Still potent. But from 8.30 to 9. Not much competition, but we've talked about it in the past. It was episode four, I believe. Jennifer slept here, but oh. then on ABC. Sorry, the Wiz kids just aren't beating T.J. Hooker. You don't go up against William Shatner and expect to win. And Heather Locklear. You're not going to beat Heather Locklear. Maybe in about eight years, but not in 1983. You know what replaced Jennifer Slept Here on Saturday nights up against Wiz Kids? This is your knockout blow, Silver Spoons. That'll do it. But yeah, aside from all of this, there was also the fact that people were still trying to get over the whole War Games thing. Mostly adults. It's like, this show made absolutely no secret that it was inspired by War Games. And that got a few adults clutching their pearls scared of their boots. Will somebody please think of the children? Yeah, the children are the ones running the computers. Yeah. It's not my fault you can't even program BASIC. I mean, it's in the name. BASIC. Basically. So, yeah. Wherever it went, CBS could not find an audience to hang on to the show, and after February, they pulled it from the schedule, canceled the show, and aired the remaining episodes sporadically. There is no official stream of the show, nor is there anyone clamoring up to do so. However, you can find some of the episodes online if you know where to look. Anything to add to this? No, I don't have anything. Mike? I love Silver Spoons. I love Silver Spoons. <laughs> Lisa, <laughs> do you love Can't... it as much as I love wings? Do you love it as much as Greg loves wings? I don't know how much Greg loves wings. As oh my gosh, gosh, do you not oh, listen to the program? Kisla! Kisla! Kisla, did you know that wings made Tony Shalhoub's career? Theme song. I can still hear the theme song in my head. <laughs> Greg, I don't think she gives a shit. She doesn't give a shit. She just wants skis, skis about the Silver Spoons theme. That is a banger. That's a banger theme song. I'm sorry. Together, we're gonna we're find, find our way. Do, 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 do. Hey, hey. Did you know that show made Alfonso Ribeiro's career? I know it. Yeah, it did. And it made Jason Bateman's career. And it made Jason Bateman's career, too. And Aaron Gray's career. And, no, Buck Rogers made Aaron Gray's career. Get I will right. fight you over that. Oh, Rogers. Come at me, bro. Come Hold at on. me. Time I out. love Buck Rogers. I love Buck Rogers, too. I love Buck Rogers the first part. I don't like so much the Buck Rogers. You didn't like Rogers. season two when they basically redid the whole show. When they redid the whole show and Aaron Gray. So, Greg, while they're talking, um, do you have anything to add about this show? Oh, it was. You know what? I got to be honest. I liked Buck I liked the Aaron fact Gray that it was well. like ahead of its time. It was popularizing the whole War Games thing, Buck the Rogers. acting and everything. Buck made Aaron career. But, yeah. Uh, I, guess I just love this. For the first time in like 372 episodes, we're having two conversations going on at once. 
This has got to be. This is all. Spot. This is all staying in, by the way. This oh, you didn't be top... where, where believe it's all staying in. This has got to be a top five episode. Oh, definitely. This kicks going places out of the top five. <laughs> oh, do we have anything to add? Yes, we do. We got to do the Joey Gallo report. Oh, Yay! that's right. Joey Gallo. He can't hit over 200, but he can sure stack a ball over the fence. It's the Joey Gallo update. Joey Gallo returned to the Twins on Wednesday. Yay! Oh boy, did he. Wait, do you want even better news? Yes. He hit a home run on Wednesday, and he hit a home run tonight on Friday. Yeah. So he's at five home runs for the season with 11 RBIs, and he's batting a robust 296. Oh, my God, that's great. He's batting 296. He could make the All-Star team right now. He'll regress back to the mean, trust me, but he's doing pretty well right now. Five home runs, and he hasn't played that many games. It says uh, he's only played uh, 10 games this year. Hey, he's the Dave Kingman of the 2020. And coincidentally, Dave Kigman just got passed for fifth place on the Mets all-time home run list by Pete Alonzo. Oh, Pete Alonzo is... He's no Dave Kigman. Oh, no. He's the real, to quote Cheeky Baby. You put respect on Pete Alonzo's name. Oh, yeah. Put him with Jumpin' Jim Burns Hell. There you go. So, in closing, WizKids, inspired by war games but went up against tough competition. And in the end, it got hacked into being just a thing on TV. But so yeah, yeah, now I think we're done with the episode. Yeah, we we totally got the Joey done. Gallo report out of the way. We, we got all the particulars about uh, WizKids. I think we just need a little bit of closure, guys. All right, so if you have a computer, and let's be honest, if you're listening to us, yeah, you have a computer. You can point it to it was a thing on TV.com. We have all those 500 episodes worth of content, including episodes, mini shows, live shows, instant reactions. Greg's had an instant reaction about WrestleMania. Mike has an instant reaction about Jeopardy. I have an instant reaction about Power Rangers. This is the sort of thing we do. And all of our episodes, all 500 episodes, are available wherever podcasts can be streamed. Remember, like and subscribe, rate and review, five stars only. Why? Positive vibes only. Because the computers told us only. No, that's only if you uh, pointed it to chat GPT. Anyway, we are all... Oh, you know what? I should ask chat GPT about this show. Oh, good! we got to have a chat GPT report about WizKid. Chico shouldn't have opened his mouth. Oh, you say that like my mouth doesn't frequently get me in trouble. Okay, I have a haiku about the TV show WizKids. Oh, we're going to have an It Was a Thing on TV haiku corner. It's a, it, it, a, it's, yeah, it's a haiku this week. Okay. Oh, good. Let's play the theme. Nice. All right. Bright young minds at work. Solving crimes with tech and wit. WizKids save the day. That's going on YouTube. By the way, if you are listening to us on the YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe to our feed. Please don't forget to hit that notification bell because you're going to want to be on the level with everything at least for the next month. One month, 11 pilots. We kick it off with an aborted version of a British favorite. And then, next week, another aborted version, another British favorite. And, maybe a tie-in with a movie that's coming out. And, the single most sought-after piece of lost media in the last 30 years. Someone found it. And that's only the first two weeks of Pilot Month. Right here. 
thought it was a thing on TV. For Greg, for Mike, I'm Chico. For Kisla, for Kisla. Hi. I'm Chico. Thank you ever so much for listening. Please be kind to each other. And we'll see you for the next one. Roar me out, Greg. Wow. Hey, guys, as a bonus, I've got ChatGPT to write me a limerick about the show Whiz Kids. What is the... Okay. Oh, this one's a good one. Oh. This episode's definitely on the keeper list. Okay, give me some stereotypical Irish music. Give me a jig. There we go. That's not racist at all. <laughs> Hold on. I love Kiesel's said that. Yes, what? I love Kiesel's reaction. Th- thank you for adding some authenticity to my mild racism, Kiesel. Uh, and now I feel like saying this in an Irish accent and a brogue, but I won't. There once were some kids who were whizzes. Their computer skills left us in tizzes. What? Oh, it's tizzies. This doesn't even rhyme. Let me try it again. There once were some kids who were whizzes. Their computer skills left us in tizzies. That doesn't even rhyme. They solved every crime in record time. Those whiz kids were quite the busy bees? Go home, chat GPT. You're drunk. I'm sending feedback to chat GPT about that limerick. It it says provide additional feedback. Three words in all caps. It doesn't rhyme. (laughs) 